afternoon and welcome to the Catherine and Arthur Saline Memorial Lecture hosted by the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geoengineering. My name is Joe Labus, uh, Department Head, and I have uh, the privilege to introduce today's speaker. Uh, but before I do that, I'd like to provide a little background on the lecture. The Catherine and Arthur Saline Memorial Lecture is supported by a fund established in 1986 by the Saline family to reflect the values expressed by Catherine and Arthur Saline in their volunteer and professional activities. Catherine's career as a volunteer and community activist spanned 35 years. She served as the chair of the Governor's Council on Aging and represented the state of Minnesota at the White House Conference on Aging in 1971 and 1981. She also founded the Opportunity Workshop, a nonprofit organization serving disabled adults. Arthur Saline built the Industrial Construction Corporation into one of the top bridge construction firms in the country. The company branched out into steel construction after merging with Allied Steel of Chicago. The firm participated in the construction, repair, and demolition of more bridges on the Mississippi River than any company in the United States. In, the rec in recognition of, this, of the Saline's varied interest, the lecture series alternates between the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geoengineering and the School of Social Work. The commitments of the Salines to education and their pride in the University of Minnesota inspired the creation of the series. Please join me in thanking uh, the representatives of the Saline family. Now I have the privilege to introduce today's speaker. Sharon Wood is Dean of the Cockrell School of Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin, and she holds the Cockrell Family Chair in Engineering. Prior to her appointment as Dean, she served as Interim Dean for one year, Department Head for the School of Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering for five years, and Director of the Ferguson Structural Engineering Laboratory for one year. She has an undergraduate degree in civil engineering from the University of Virginia and her graduate degrees, both MS and PhD from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Her research focuses on understanding the earthquake response of reinforced concrete structures and monitoring the service life response of infrastructure systems. She has served on federal advisory committees for the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, the National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program, and the U.S. Geological Survey. Sharon has received many awards, but I'll simply note that she is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, and she is the outgoing president of the American Concrete Institute. So please join me in welcoming Sharon Wood. opportunity for me to talk with you today. I'm going to talk to you about um, some work that I did a few years ago that was collaborative with the uh, colleagues in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And I think what I, we, I learned a lot of things during this process, um, especially about differences in time scales. So if we look at um, electrical engineering and just the, you know, communications. So the first phone call took place um, 125 years ago. Now we're totally overwhelmed with communications. So as civil engineers, if we're going to move into these fields, we need to leverage this type of technology. And the technology does move a lot faster in electrical and computer engineering than it does in, in civil engineering. So I'm going to be talking to you about monitoring structures. And if I think back at the beginning of my career, which was 30 years ago, the only real type of, of actual information we had about infrastructure response was from earthquake monitoring. There would be a series of, um, of strong motion stations that would be positioned out, um, the one I, uh, primarily in California at least at that time. And if an earthquake occurred, you might get a fax about three days later that had a quick sheet. Maybe a month later you get a tape 
where you had data from the earthquake, but it was a very slow process. And what we're trying to do is, you know, leverage this technology. You'll notice in this picture there are solar panels, so it's, it's much quicker now. Um, when you started going into structural monitoring, the first project that I worked on when I got to the University of Texas was the Fred Hartman Bridge. This is um, over the Houston Ship Channel. It's one of the uh, primary uh, hurricane evacuation routes from the city of Houston. This bridge was completed in 1985. And if you look at um, this video from 1986, you'll see that very early on, there are significant problems, vibrations with the cables. Okay, so the bridge is less than a year old. Um, you've got the cables kind of going, going crazy. This was the first um, cable stay bridge in the state, second cable stay bridge in the state of Texas. There were 192 stays, and the, um, the welds broke on about 190 of them. So this captured the attention of the Department of Transportation, and they really wanted to make sure that this bridge was safe. So our role in this was to do some tests to understand the fatigue performance of these stay cables. And what the state ended up doing was putting some sensors very similar to the ones I showed you for the earthquake monitoring. These are accelerometers. They're always powered. They're always listening. And when a wire breaks in the stay cable, they detect that break and then they, they record it. And so this is just data from the lab. And it just shows you that um, th they, they listen all the time. If something happens, they record a short segment. And then they could use triangulation to identify where the wire break occurred. So this is very similar to the strong motion uh, earthquake response that I showed you a minute ago. The sensor is always on. Um, there are miles of cables on that bridge to provide to access all these sensors. And you have to have a lot of power there. Um, I think the other bridge that all of it you know about, I got this picture from, from Kathy, is um, the new I-35W bridge over the Mississippi. 500 sensors there. All kinds of data is coming from it, but again, you're, those sensors are always on. You have to have power, and you have a ton of data that you need to analyze to interpret the response. What I'm going to be talking about today, the main focus of the talk, is kind of the antithesis of this. Think about it as almost wear, you know, wearables are now the buzzword in terms of monitoring your performance. We're moving more to that side. We want to talk about sensors that have absolutely no power. The only time you can get information from them is when you're out there interrogating them. And so we want to have a very simple type of, of uh, sensor, but it can tell you things that you would not know otherwise. So one of the problems with monitoring these infrastructure systems is that every single one of them is unique. If you think about trying to monitor, uh, monitor like an aircraft or something, you at least know you're making a large number of the same type of, of, of aircraft system. And so you can come up with specialized sensors for it. For all the bridges that are out here, every single one is different. The length scales are varying tremendously. You, you might want to um, measure cracks that are forming, which are in the order of, of hundredths of an inch, and yet your, your bridge is miles long. Um, a lot of times, the critical components are not visible after the bridge is completed. So I showed you the Fred Hartman Bridge. The critical components there were pre-stressing wires that formed the cables, but they were embedded in grout, and then there was a polyethylene um, layer around them. So you could never see if wire breaks were occurring. That's why you had to resort to the, non, the uh, sensors that I showed. And then finally, most of the time, it's really hard to detect when the initial damage occurs. If you can catch it early, you can do preventative maintenance and you can extend the life of the structure and minimize the total uh, service life costs. But if you let it go, you get so much damage that you might be at a, you're at a much higher risk of failure, or at least the repair costs are much higher. So I showed you two examples where it, the costs of putting in these continuous monitoring systems were justified. Right? A brand new bridge that was a critical infrastructure link that just had, was scaring people. And a bridge that had collapsed in the middle of a city. You, the people here needed to know that the new bridge was safe. So what happens with these, though, is it's, it's often hard to figure out what the triggering mechanism should be. And 
you really, if you're monitoring these continuously, there's a lot of data that you have to look at to find out what is really happening. And then what we've learned, and I know Kathy's seen the same thing in your test, is you have daily cycles due to thermal cycles, and that those cycles often will overwhelm the data that's really important. So it's hard to detect these changes, or at least come up with algorithms to detect the data. So that our target monitoring framework was we wanted to come up with sensors that were very, very low cost. <clears throat> we couldn't, you know, most typical infrastructure systems, you cannot afford to have millions of dollars invested to monitor a bridge that costs in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, or ones that, that where you might have um, tens of thousands of bridges across a state. We wanted our sensors to be durable so that you never had to go in for maintenance. That essentially means there can't be any batteries. Once you put them in place, they have to, you never touch them again, and you, you, um, you don't have to worry about their service life. As I mentioned, we want to interrogate them intermittently. Within um, the United States, every bridge has to be inspected every two years, which means someone is out there looking at it at least. This gives you the opportunity to do this intermittent interrogation. And for a lot of different of the deterioration mechanisms, you don't need to be monitoring continuously. You can take snapshots every two years and get a feel for what's happening. And then finally, it has to be very easy to interpret the data. We think of, um, we real, our ideal was to have a, a yes or no. Just has damage occurred or has it not? So um, I, I still remember the day I went and talked with a colleague in electrical and computer engineering, and I had this idea for some sensors. And he looked at me and he said, yeah, that might work, but you know, it's just not practical. You're going to have all these wires, you need a lot of power. And he said, why don't we do something passive? And the passive sensor means there's absolutely no power associated with it. You take something, you, we're going to embed it in the concrete. It's not going to influence the behavior of the bridge at all, but when you interrogate it, you're going to get data back. And so our, our motivation for this is the electronic article surveillance tags. They have these in every drugstore around the world. It's to keep people from shoplifting. They're little stickers. You put them on the bottle of aspirin, and if you walk out the door, the alarms go off, right? So that's, that's our easy switch. Did you pay for it? Yes, because the, the clerk takes it, and he, he, he or she will zap the capacitor. And if, they di if you didn't pay for it, you're going to set off the alarms. Um, these, you can buy these in rolls. They cost a few pennies a piece, and there's you know, there are no wires, there's no power, it's just a very simple system. So that's what we're trying to do in, um, for, for physical or civil infrastructure. So as I mentioned, um, one of the nice things about civil infrastructure is you do have to go out and inspect. So you know that an engineer will be out looking at a bridge um, at least once every two years. There may not be power there, there may not be other things, but you have, a, you have someone going out and looking at it. So we tried several applications when we started out, and we, what we came to, um, we decided upon was looking at corrosion of reinforced concrete in uh, bridge decks. And one of the reasons we did that, this is a little bit old, but the US, in the US we spend over a billion dollars every year repairing this type of damage. So if we can catch this corrosion early on, we might be able to mill the top off, get rid of the concrete that's contaminated with the chlorides, and place a new layer of concrete. That's going to help, help reduce the overall costs. Um, and so if I can characterize how we want these threshold sensors to work, the uh, threshold sensor itself, um, we're, we're viewing it here as it's embedded within the concrete. It's at the same level of the reinforcement. And what will happen is that contaminants will penetrate down through the concrete. We anticipate that that's going to be fairly uniform. It's going to be coming from the top surface because that's where the de-icing salts are located. And when they reach the level of the reinforcement, we want to know the risk for corrosion is high. That would allow us to give us time to actually make, uh, do maintenance before there is structural damage. <coughs> Now, there are some techniques currently used for this. The one that's most common is they will drag chains. 
So you, you take the chains, you drag them across, and what happens is rust occupies a much higher volume, 10 times the volume of, of the native, of the base steel. So what, when, a, when rust does start to form, it forms cracks in the concrete because of the expanding volume. As you drag these chains over, you'll hear voids. But you've gotten a long way down the line in corrosion by this time because you've, you've had these cracks occur. There are other electrochemical techniques you can use. You can do half cell potential. One of the problems there, though, is that the, um, the readings that you get are extremely sensitive to the moisture content of the concrete. So if you think about a bridge, you have no control. You're going out there once every two years. You have absolutely no control about what the baseline moisture content is. If it rained for five days before, it's going to be much moister than if it's been dry. So we wanted to try to avoid uh, that variability. And then just to give you a feel, um, these are our sensors that, oops, I'm sorry, passive sensors. We had no batteries, no wires, no processing. The passive sensors would just be attached to the, um, the rebar cages. They're fairly robust. So when they're casting the slab, they can walk on them. They'll still uh, record. So I, I showed you this sticker a little earlier. This is essentially an LC circuit. Um, if you remember back to your first physics class or that electrical engineering class, this has a characteristic frequency. It's the same basic differential equation as a single degree of freedom oscillator. So this will resonate. Um, just to give you a cartoon, we have a concrete slab. We place the sensors at various sensors within or various locations within the slab at the level of the reinforcement. Um, the way we're going to interrogate this is we have an external reader, this, and we'll, we'll look at the um, impedance of the uh, sensor, and we'll be able to tell what its condition is. So this is a view of our sensor. Um, we decided to make them out of uh, fiber-reinforced cement, cement paste. <clears throat> this, was, this was a way to provide a, a strong coating, so if a worker were to step on this, they wouldn't, wouldn't damage the sensor itself. But also, it has essentially the same um, thermal properties as the concrete surrounding it. When we did our first trials, we used a marine epoxy. And that was great because we could see what the sensor looked like. But the epoxy has much higher thermal coefficients of expansion. And so it was actually causing damage in our structure. The other thing that you'll see is very faintly, you can see a, a, a washer here. It's a very thin washer of steel. The electrochemical properties of that washer are essentially the same as those of the rebar. So this washer will, will corrode at a slightly faster rate than the surrounding reinforcement. So this is, this is our passive sensor platform. Um, this is a handmade RF circuit. You can see we've got a small capacitor there. We just take a tube of PVC, slice of PVC, you wrap a, a coil or, or magnet wire around it that gives you your inductor. And then this is what we're calling our sacrificial element. It's a steel washer, and that is going to influence the response of that resonant circuit. So um, this is a lab setup. We have a bulky gain phase analyzer here. But this reader coil is completely separated from it. There are no wires going in or out. And um, we can. In, in the final version, not in the version that's shown here, we could interrogate about eight inches. And it didn't matter, matter whether we were going through air or through concrete. That was about the read range we were able to achieve, which means that you could attach this to a vehicle and you could, or at least a device, and you could just scan over the top of the slab. I talked about a resonant circuit. What we measure is the, um, the, impedance, the phase of the impedance at, through the gain phase analyzer. And you see here that when you have just the resonant circuit, there's a very well-defined frequency, as I mentioned, just like a single degree of freedom oscillator. When you put the sacrificial element in, it causes the frequency to shift, and it also damps out the response of that single degree of freedom oscillator, or the, it damps out the phase response. However, this is still sufficiently deep that it can be detected when you're, trying, when you're doing your scanning. And so the way that we're going to be able to detect when corrosion is present is this blue line corresponds to the base sensor. The sacrificial element shows no evidence of corrosion. Therefore, we have, the, we have response at a higher frequency. 
And once that, that sacrificial element, that washer, has corroded, you'll go back to this, um, the baseline frequency. So we will be able to tell, interrogating through the concrete, what the state condition of this embedded reinforcement is just based on the frequency of our um, sensor. So let me give you a really simple example. We're going to take the sensor, we're going to put it in some salt water, and what we're going to do is just go through wet and dry cycles. So vary the, um, the level of the water to let the water will go down, provide oxygen to promote corrosion, and then we'll put it back up so we have more uh, salt getting in there. And what, ha what you'll see is that the frequency is pretty constant at first. That's the higher frequency range. Then we go through a transition region, and then we're in a range where the, um, co the corrosion has occurred, and we're back to the, the lower frequency. And there's, there are some small minor differences. Differences less than 10% are not ind indicative of corrosion, but once you get beyond about a 10% change, you know corrosion is occurring. So this is the blue, the blue region is where there's no corrosion. <coughs> The orange is a transition region, and then the green, the corrosion has occurred. So more details. You can see that there is a little bit of variation. These are occurring, you know, um, we, I think these were interrogated about twice a week. But we shifted from blue to orange to green. And once you make that shift, once the corrosion starts, it never goes back. So unlike the half cell potential, where your response is influenced by the moisture conditions, that never changes with this sensor. When you, when you look at the sensor, <clears throat> and it's very easy to look at it when you have it just sitting in a tub of water, you'll see corrosion occurring on the surface pretty early on. However, you have to have quite a bit of, of corrosion through the, in, through the thickness before you, you are able to influence the circuit. And it's just the nature of the, that, um, the sacrificial element. You basically have to have, um, you have to get down to the skin thickness of the, of the metal itself before you'll ha have a change in the frequency. So what, we, what we've learned from this is that the, our change is irreversible. Once corrosion occurs, we will never have an indication that, that it has, corrosion has not occurred. Um, we, our sensor readings can't be sensitive to temperature or humidity fluctuations, and they, have, they uh, reflect the condition of the adjacent reinforcement. And so what I'll be doing is demonstrating all of these to you. And I think the key point here is we, we did a lot of long-term tests to evaluate our sensors. We, we tend to do a year and a half or so testing. We had these in um, an unconditioned un, uh, building on our research campus. So we, they vary between about 30 degrees and 100 degrees temperature. We provided water sor sources so that, and um, sometimes we had salt water, sometimes we had fresh water. So we were trying to evaluate all different kinds of conditions here. We did use uncoated reinforcement. A lot of people will tell you, well, we're never going to use black steel in a, in a bridge deck. We're, we would use epoxy coated steel. I really don't think that's an issue because we're really trying to be able to measure just how deep have the um, contaminants uh, traveled within the concrete. So this is the basic setup. We had uh, four beams, essentially, with, with the sensors attached to the reinforcement. Um, we set them up in a case where we had a constant negative moment. That, that allowed us to have cracks along the top surface of these beams. Um, the cracks gave us a pathway that we could have contaminants go into the concrete. And we just set up tubs of water that dripped water um, onto the, the constant moment region. So some of our slabs, we were dripping salt water to provide chlorides. Other slabs, we drip uh, tap water just to go through the moisture cycles. For this particular set of tests, we had eight sensors in each one of the slabs. Um, they were, we went through the test for 19 months. Um, our test duration was usually dependent upon the time to graduation for the students. <laughs> so whenever the student wanted to graduate, that's when we did our autopsies. Um, and so by, by having a region here that's shown in blue that was the splash zone, we would have multiple regions along the length. So the, the sensors at the end of the beams never saw any moisture variations. The ones in the middle saw um, quite frequent ones. And here, uh, 
uh, sensors two and seven, there was moisture would penetrate through the concrete, but there was nothing coming in from the top. So just to give you a feel for some of the results, um, we had three sensors in this particular test that was subjected to salt water that switched from the, um, the uncorroded to the corroded state during, during our testing. You see that there's a large variation in the number of days that it took for this to occur. We had uh, two that were kind of in the transition region where they just started to make the transition to corroding. And then we had three that didn't corrode at all. And you can see that they've remained fairly stable here. Um, just to, for full disclosure, we also had uh, eight sensors in the slab that was exposed to only uh, tap water, and they all remained fairly constant. There was, there was nothing here that indicated corrosion was occurring. So the, the lucky students are the ones who get to do the autopsies here, and so you can see what we're doing is just scarifying off the top layer of concrete so that we could see what the sensors look like and see what the rebar looks like. And what we found is that at the end, where our sensors indicated no corrosion, indeed, there was no indication of corrosion of that sacrificial element. In the middle, where we had our highest risk of corrosion because we were ponding the salt water, that sacrificial element has completely corroded. All that's left is just rust stains. And so that, is, um, that was what we were hoping to have occur. And what you should be able to see is that um, we also have quite, we have just surface corrosion of the surrounding reinforcement here, whereas we still have nice, clean, bare steel at the end of the slabs. So if you look at all the tests that we ran, um, in the regions where we expected to have no corrosion, 23 of our sensors indicated no corrosion. Where we expected to have corrosion, nine sensors indicated corrosion, and, and there was one that was no corrosion. And we ran these types of tests three or four times, and there was always one. And it just was, it was really annoying, because it's like, you know, you, you know how it's supposed to work, but it doesn't work this way. And so um, one of these sensors would give us a false negative reading. If you're going to have a false reading, you'd much rather have false negative than false positive, because the false, false positive, you'd go in and do repair work when you don't really need to do it. Um, but the, the time to, to detection of corrosion varied considerably. And that, that um, was a concern for us. So if I look at this sensor that was directly under the salt water, should have been, should have corroded, what you see is that we do have cracks forming, but the cracks did not cross the sensor. And, and unfortunately, the one, the critical sensor that was, we would like to have a, a nice clean view after the autopsy, well, we kind of dinged it during the, um, trying to chip it out. So I can't show you the complete, um, the complete uh, passive uh, washer here, but you can see there really, a, there's a, only a little sign of corrosion. There's very little indication of corrosion there also in, in the sensor, on the top of the sensor. So what we've learned from this and what we learned from um, our other tests that I didn't describe is that the, the initiation of corrosion is extremely sensitive to the location of the crack. And if your crack, if your crack is close to your passive element, but it doesn't quite cross it, you're not going to get corrosion forming. And it's, it's frustrating as heck because you have a sensor right there, but it's not telling you what's happening. So it's not terribly useful in its current configuration. And um, it was about at this point that the grad student decided, well, let me take, let me go back to this, this tank of water and see what happens if I simulate a crack. So he coated the surface of a sensor with epoxy, but he had just what he scratched through it, so it was only exposed right in the center. And what you see is that for a given time period, if, if the surface, if, if this uh, washer is exposed, there's corrosion everywhere. But if you only have a small crack, that corrosion product only forms in one place. And I think the corrosion product actually blocks more of the, uh, the chlorides getting, getting down in there. So it actually slows the process down. And if you look at the data, having a uniform surface, corrosion occurs after 70 days or so, whereas if there's that simulated crack, it's taking two to three times as much time before that corrosion occurs. So, the solution to this was to try to find a way to diffuse 
those contaminants. And so um, we're talking here about a diffusion layer, something that would make the surface of the sensor more uniform. It turns out that a paper towel works very well for this purpose. Because it, you, know, you see the commercials where they put the paper towel and it spreads out. That's exactly what you want. You put a paper towel on top. So I'm going to show you some tests where these are just the bare sensors. This has a, a nice paper towel. Moisture comes down and it just spreads out. So this is now going to reduce our sensitivity to the cracks. What we also did is we decided, you know, we don't have to build a whole slab and let nature crack it. We can force the location of the crack. So let's do a test where we put one crack right down the center of the washer, one crack at the edge of the washer, and one crack at the edge of the sensor so it doesn't intersect the uh, steel at all. And we just use a, a metal shim to form the crack. Um, much easier specimens to move around. You can control them a lot more. So the bare washers, what you see is when the crack was right across the center of the washer, it corroded first. If it was at the edge of the washer, it took more time, but it eventually corroded. And if you were at the edge of the sensor, so you had no direct contact, it was going to take forever. Because now you're, the contaminants are controlled by just the transport phenomena through the base concrete as opposed to through the crack. On the other hand, with your diffusion layer, they all lined up on top of each other. It, it's, right, it's right there. So this gives us a way of removing the variability of trying to understand where the cracks are going to form. Because you do not know that in advance. So um, I think that. The, the addition of this diffusion layer really was what makes this sensor possible. Um, we've reduced the variability. Our likelihood of false negative readings is reduced. And now we have something that can tell us what's happening inside of concrete without having any, um, anything in actually, no wires going into the concrete. Um, it was very easy to come up with an, electro, um, an electrical or circuit model to understand how the sensor was working. Okay? I, can, I can come up with a model of our, of our resonance sensor. I can come up with a model for the washer. This, the resistance of this washer changes from very low to very high as the corrosion goes, um, is, increases. But what happens is there are these three different coupling factors. And you don't know what those coupling factors are if you're just trying to build this model. As we would change those coupling factors, we could reproduce the same type of response that I showed you. But we, you're guessing. You, you had no way of, of um, really understanding what, those, what parameters were occurring. So what this meant is that we were trying to guess what the... Um, what size of the sensor was going to be best, and that sort of thing, or of the sacrificial element. So what the student was able to do was come up with a coupled finite element model that allowed him to model the, um, both the, the electromagnetic properties of the sensor itself and combine that with the, an overall model. And it, it, it basically, this is his coupled finite element model. Um, he's looking at the individual wires here that form the inductive coil. He's got another um, finite element model that shows the, um, the, uh, the sacrificial element. And with this, he's able to um, detect. You can see how the, the electromagnetic field changes between the case where there's no sacrificial element and one where there is a sacrificial element. So this gave him us the ability to go in and optimize our sensor. And so this, this is just one that's showing what happens as you change the size of the sacrificial element. How does that influence your frequencies? Um, we're able to get responses that very much duplicated what we had done in our experiments. But it gave us a basis for doing this computationally also. So in, in summary, um, I think what we've been able to demonstrate with these models is that you can take something that's very simple. You can take a, a sensor that costs $5 or less to fabricate. You can uh, embed it in the concrete. You can interrogate through the concrete. You're 
The fact that your next two reinforcing bars does not interfere with your signal. Our readings are not sensitive to the temperature or humidity of the um, con surrounding concrete. The fact that the, when our um, key element corroded, it was an irreversible change. So we can, we can say with great confidence what's happening to the re reinforcement that we can't see. And what we can do is um, we can detect threshold levels of corrosion before serious structural damage occurs. By changing the thickness of our sacrificial element, we can change this level of corrosion that, occur, that is occurring, or what the threshold is. So as I mentioned, our goal was to come up with a very inexpensive sensor, something that people would be willing to embed in common bridges. It wouldn't have a, a huge increase in the cost, but it would allow us to, um, to be able to detect information about what's happening inside. So the key to this all was the diffusion layer. If we didn't use the diffusion layer, it was, we still had too much scatter in our data. Um, we had run a series of tests where we just let this go for a long period of time. And it, with, with enough time, you got more uniform corrosion occurring in the slabs. But we really wanted to be able to catch things early. And so that's why the diffusion layer was so important. And then finally, the ability to have the electromechanical um, finite element models gives us the opportunity to optimize the size and the configuration of these sensors. So I, I want to thank um, the people who worked on this project. Um, Ali Obo Yusuf was the PhD student who did most of the work that I talked about today. Um, Dean Nykirk and uh, Praveen Pasupi were in electrical and computer engineering, and they were fantastic colleagues. Um, I think I mentioned I started going in with just one conversation, and we ended up with a 12-year collaboration on this. And then finally, the work I showed today was funded by NIST, but earlier work on this area was also funded by the National Science Foundation. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. This is being recorded, so if you have a question, I'll bring the microphone to you, and then you can ask your question. So questions or comments? I saw you first. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> sure, I, I'm from the bridge office and I do deal with maintenance and uh, programming for bridges and so this would be very useful technology obviously. Right. Um, and I guess I'm curious about the reader and what the reader is composed of or you know how that works and then uh, we are moving toward newer materials in the retrofit of our bridges such as fiber wraps where we might be burying components again that Right. And, and repaired bridges, and we would not have direct uh, inspection of older elements that are being reused now in a, in a new a shock read application that you've since buried, and that's where you do have the concern. So right. I'm, I think I'm keenly interested in how this would play out. Yeah, so when we, when we started the test, we had to use a, a bench scale gain phase a, analyzer. And that gave us a lot of data. Once we, we went to this model and realized that all we needed to do was look at the frequency, that greatly simplified the, what the reader looks like. And so um, Praveen was able to get this down essentially to just a card that you could pl um, So it, it can be, a, actually, we came up with a mock-up unit that was you know, a couple inches square. So it's a very portable unit. Um, our ideal was that we would be able to drive down the highway at, at um, highway speed, so 60 miles an hour, and just scan as we went. And that was not possible. It takes longer to do the, the scan. It takes, I think, on the order of a second to do a scan. But the fact that you can still do it as you're moving along, um, some kind of moving bridge closure would probably be sufficient to do that. So the, the funding for our project ended before we came up with something that could be used, um, I would say, commercially or something like that. But I think it's, it's really the, te the technology is there. It's not too difficult. With respect to being able to read through things, um, as long as you're not trying to read through metal, so as long as you don't have a metal plate over top or something, it's, you know, carbon fiber or any type of fiberglass, um, asphalt, it's not going to interfere with the signal. So, you know, the, as I mentioned, I think the, the distance of reading through air 
and reading through concrete was, or the signal strength was about the same. There really was no difference. Thank you. So, yeah. Paul kind of stole half of my question. So I was interested in the reader too, and, and um, because I, I envisioned the same thing that you did, that you can do this uh, through some kind of a vehicle on top. So right. how accurately does the reader need to be placed? So you talked about up and down. How about right. side to side? Yeah, that's the kind of a pro that's, that's more of a problem. Um, I think with our more recent one, it, you have to be, have at least some overlap. So that, that makes it a little more difficult, right? We, um, we lost a few. We, in that, the one I showed you where they were casting the slab, the student who cast the specimens wasn't there when, when they tore it down. And so um, we had to find them. And so we did have to do some scanning. But there was a way to, to do it. It just it, it wasn't as easy as we hoped. It, because it, the signal is pretty small, yeah. So if you, if you line them up and kind of know where they are, I think it would be reasonable, but you still might have to have multiple scanners and only to detect one sensor at a time, yeah. yeah quick question, I really like the idea. Um, so basically your diffusion layer is drawing in all the moisture to have like a uniform moisture over your sacrificial plate. Right. In northern climates, does that pose any like durability, free thaw damage potential for like localized areas? Well, it's, it's only taking the moisture that's filtering down anyway. So it's not as if it's adding any additional moisture. But you're putting like that flame. I don't know, I'm just asking a question. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't thought about that, but it, I don't, it's not, it's just spreading it out over the top of the sensor. So I don't think it's gonna be doing that. One thing that, that did happen, though, is we, we started off using like cups to, to make the molds. And you notice in cups, they've got this, um, the surface on the bottom. And so when you stick that down in the sensor, or when you take a sensor like this and put it in the concrete, you get an air void. And so what we did see was the contaminants would come down, they'd concentrate, and then they'd go around. And we had more corrosion under our sensor than we had above. So that's why we changed to the semicircle so that we didn't have a concentration there. And we, we did not see that when we started moving to the, um, the cementitious-based sensor also, body also. So those were some of the reasons we, we moved to that, that shape. All right, since, since I have the mic, I'll, I'll ask a question. <laughs> I, I think it's fascinating, the, the collaboration between um, two different fields of, of engineering. And so what have you done from the, the what did you do different to have that happen, that, that culture of, of collaboration between different uh, disciplines to solve um, what, what is a problem? And, and what would you say we as an industry or as an academia need to do for, to get more of that to happen? You know, that's a really, really good question. I think I mentioned at the beginning how pace of technology is really different in the two fields. And what, what I found most interesting was we'd get 75% to what I thought the problem had been solved, and they wanted to move on and come up with a new problem to solve. And I was like, no, 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 we want to do these long-term tests. We want to demonstrate. And that, that was the only tension we had, right? And any time we could come up with a new problem, they, were, they loved it. But they didn't, they didn't like the, the long, or the, all the validation testing we did. And I think that's inherent in structural engineering, right? So I think that's, that was the only part that I would call would be the friction. And I anticipate it's going to take us, us as structural engineers a while before we're willing to just start adopting new technology as easily. Yeah. OK, I have a new bridge. OK. How many sensors do I need to put in it? How do yeah, you, that's how a do really good question. Um, all right, so there are may, people in this room who do much more of this than I do. Our baseline number was something like a grid, a 10-foot grid is probably going to be sufficient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and it could be, if you know water's draining more toward the curb, you could put them along the curb line too, and that would give you the worst case. Right. But that, that was kind of the, the rough number we've come up with. Just one follow-up question to that is related to the crack. So if it's on a 10-foot grid, but it misses a crack for whatever reason, then you might not capture the area of the bridge that's corroding quicker than the case where it has to get through the 
the intact concrete. Right. So I think um, you're right. So honestly, if you have a higher moment region, you might want to put some more sensors there. Um, yes. Or maybe put one, put your grid, try to align your grid with the stresses. Yeah. OK. Um, please uh, join me in thanking uh, Thank Sharon for the saline lecture. <laughs>